I think one of the problems with Tiger Woods is he doesn't overtly uh, exude someone, I don't know, you'd say is proud of being black. The word that doesn't really come to mind when we discuss Serena previously, I would definitely say in the last two to three years, is that she's sexy. There are communities within the black community that are historically vegan. So you have the Rastafarians. As a young hip hop fan, a group like Public Enemy got me as a young boy to go to the library. Myself personally, I just remain very skeptical that it can be a party that would serve the interests of the, uh, the expert. I feel like we celebrate people who are mediocre. I'm just going to put it out there. In mm. America, when you meet a successful business person, they are millionaires. They are billionaires. I'm successful, but I can also be angry. I can be frightened. I can be hurt. I can exist in many different manifestations of who I am. Let's face it. If you don't know every single um, piece of EU law, every trade deal that we're part that we're part of because we're members of the EU, every system, every framework that gets us drugs into this country, that all ends with no deal. So if you're arguing for no deal and you don't know all that stuff, you literally, and I mean literally, don't know what you're talking about. So you going back to Africa, you're more or less to an extent, and this might sound weird, almost like the colonial master. Good evening. Ooh, hello. Good evening. You guys came. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming this evening. I appreciate you. you've all had probably long days at work. It's a very hot day today. Um, so I really appreciate you guys coming out to It's All Black Academic Live. My name is Jordan Jarrett Bryan. Um, I am the host and creator of It's All Black Academic. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do, who we are, and why we think what we do is important. And then I'll go through the menu of what we're going to be doing uh, later on this evening. So what? It's All Black Academic is a YouTube show where we have a panel, an all black panel, discussing a variety of different subjects and issues from uh, politics to sports. Uh, we do fashion, culture, music, food. Uh, we did one on the greatest era to live in. A whole wide breadth of different subjects that we feel are interesting and engaging that we thought need to be discussed in a way that maybe isn't being discussed in the mainstream television. Um, we have an honest, um, an intelligent, and progressive discussion and debate around a lot of those issues. That's very, very important because I feel like we can all discuss issues in our circles, be it family, friends, or at work, but the way to really progress a debate is to be honest and open and come, a bit, come at it with a different perspective. And we try our best on this All Black Academic to come at our debates with a slightly different perspective that makes the viewer of our shows think about why, why they think the way they think about a subject. So we all have an opinion on something, but we're hoping that by the time you've watched one of our shows, you may just think, you know what, yeah, my girl had a point, you know, she's, she's got a point, or yeah, yeah, you know what, I didn't think of it like that, but it made an interesting point, and you might just have a different perspective on a particular topic. Um, that's the what, the who, um, myself, and I have a fantastic team, many of whom you will have seen here today, um, of young, energetic, intelligent, creative, vibrant, good-looking, uh, competent, uh, team who, who do it for free. They're amazing. Uh, we, we work really hard um, to create the content that we create uh, because we believe in it, we believe it's needed, um, and I want to thank all of my team um, a lot because they give up their time for free and they, they've done it for now. This is our, going into our third season, so I want to big up my team um, as well for the All Black Academic TV uh, crew. So yeah, thank you to them. And we get to the why. So why is it's all black academic uh, needed and why is it important? So there's two reasons for this. I was thinking about this last week and I think we're about a year from when I initially thought of the idea of the show. I believe it was the, the, the latter part of June. And the reason why I started the show up was initially because I was fed up of only seeing black faces on television en masse in either a sporting arena, an entertainment arena or, or relating to crime. 
Those are the only three areas I was noticing I was seeing multiple black people at any one time on television. Now, as someone that works, I work, two of those areas are areas that I do a lot of my work, sports and entertainment. But I know so many intelligent, competent, successful, vibrant, progressive black people across a wide breadth of different areas, from politics to business to science and, and, and even more than that. I thought to myself, why am I not seeing any of these people on television? They only call us up when, we, when they want us to review a, a football game or talk about Stormzy or the latest knife crime spate that's happening in some part of London. And I just thought, all the people that I know, why are they not on television? So I thought, I want to do a show that showcases the breadth and the, 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 the wealth that we have within our culture. We did a show on season one, I remember, and uh, Jay Davidson made a, a comment that stuck in my mind in that black, black culture is very rich. And she didn't mean rich in terms of finances. She meant there's so many layers to, to us and what we can offer. So much more than just talking about sport and entertainment. And then the second reason I started up this all black academic was because I wanted young black boys and girls to however, they, however old they are, however they consume their television, their programming, when they watch a program, they saw not only black people on, on their screens, but they saw black people from, again, a wide breadth of, of different subjects. I think it's fantastic that we see the likes of Raheem Sterling and Stormzy doing so well. But for me, it was very, very important that young black boys and girls don't believe that's the only way to be successful and acquire wealth. And more and more of my friends are having their first, second and third uh, child or children. And it was just important to me that when they get to 10, 20, 30, it was more normal to see not only black faces, but black faces across a wide plethora of different uh, areas and subjects. So that was very, very important to me. And, and we, we work really hard to ensure that our debates are progressive, engaging. We have a lot of fun doing our shows as well. But those are the two main reasons why I started up It's All Black Academic. Right, I'm going to get to our panel in just a moment, but before I do that, I want to just very briefly talk a little bit about support. So, as Black Academic TV guys, we really need you guys to help support us. And the support can come in two ways, in two forms. The first form is financial. Let's just get to it. What we do, <laughs> what we do costs a lot of money, um, and we believe in it, and we really enjoy what we do. And we're doing this for the culture, because like I say, I believe that we feel we need to see more shows and more debates <laughs> Um, like what we're doing. You'd be surprised how much these shows that we do on YouTube and these live shows, there'll be more of these live shows, by the way, how much they cost, but you'd also be surprised how two pounds, five pounds, 10 pounds, if you really like me, 100 pounds, can go to helping us continue doing what we're doing. So if you enjoy the content that we're creating, and if you believe in the content we're creating, any financial uh, contribution from you guys is hugely appreciated. On our fantastic website, we have, a, uh, we have an area now where you can give us literally two pounds, four pounds, let me get the way, uh, two pounds, four pounds, whatever you want that helps us do what, do, do what we do. The second way you guys can help support us, and I, again, I was, this kind of came to me last week, in some ways actually equally, if not more important than financial contributions. I imagine everybody in this room has about 17 WhatsApp groups on their phone, okay? So, if you guys can just literally send a link to any of your, your circles, your work friends, just talking about what we do makes a massive, massive difference to helping us grow what we're doing. We can promote ourselves and do what we're doing, but we're gonna really see the, 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 the audience and the fan base of what we're doing really grow if you guys can support. And that could just be telling someone at work, this is a new show on YouTube called Black Academic TV, check it out. What I want to do now while I talk for the next 30 seconds is everyone to get their phone out and if you're on social media, please subscribe to our channel. You can see us there, Black Academic TV. If you're on social media, we're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you have some time um, tonight, tomorrow, in the next few days, have a look at our fantastic website where all of our content is on there, videos, we have a podcast. So if podcasts are more your thing, you can download the Acast app or find us on Spotify. So you can consume all of our content, all of our blogs, all of our good stuff, it's on our website, that's our central page for all of our content, but just by sharing our content with some people, that really makes a difference and helps us out a lot. Okay, so this evening, you're not here to, to hear me talk. The way it's gonna work is I'm gonna call up our first panel uh, to have a discussion. There will be a Q&A section at the end of that debate. Oh, by the way, just very quickly, I remembered. Last night, I went to the Royal Albert Hall to see Gladys Knight. Great concert, loved it, it was amazing. As well as enjoying the concerts and having a great time with my mum, who's here as well, 
one thing struck me that I said to myself, I would love to do an It's All Black Academic live, maybe not in the Royal Albert Hall, but somewhere as big and somewhere with the stature that that place has. When I do get there, when, when me and the team get to that level, I will be imposing a no mobile phone or a mobile phone ban on the shows for two reasons. One, I want everybody to engage in what it is that we're doing and really consume and be present. Um, and secondly, uh, I just think it's, it's more fun if you just watch what's going on. I want you to contribute and think about the questions that you can contribute to the debate. However, we're not quite there yet. So, get your phones out, take pictures, make videos, and please hashtag us. Please hashtag us, Blackademic Live. If you're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, please hashtag us, Blackademic Live. We are Blackademic with no C, that's very important, that was froze people. Blackademic with no C, and Shalom, who looks after our social media. Any questions you have, get them on there, and I promise we'll read them out just a bit, a bit later on. So, the first debate we're gonna have, and I'll call my panel to the front in just a second, the first debate we're gonna have is, we're gonna have a debate on debates, it sounds a bit weird. We're gonna have a discussion on whether black pundits should decline or should refuse to go on certain platforms, shows, and certain networks when a particular topic comes to the fore, or whether it's really, really important to always have, no matter what the show is, if there's a debate that is affecting our community, we have to always have somebody on that panel, in that room, as a black face. That's our first, um, our first debate. To give it a bit of context, to show you guys a little bit of what we're kind of thinking, where we're going with this particular debate, I've got a very short video with three, uh, three short clips that will hopefully contextualize a little bit better what our first debate is going to be about, and then I'll get our panelists on the, on the front, on the, uh, up on this stage here. So can we get our first video up, please? How is he the victim in the scenario? This is a pregnant woman who had to arrange new levels of protection because of the amount of racist abuse she was receiving, which escalated when she announced she was pregnant. She's always had racist abuse, but when she announced her pregnancy, it multiplied because there is so much toxic racism in our society. That's not Danny Baker's fault. That's yes. not Danny Baker's fault, but what is it? Danny Baker's fault is that he did something which was so offensive that when I first saw it, I actually thought it was a prank. I just thought nobody, nobody who the BBC gives a platform could be stupid enough to say this and not intend it to be racist because it is one of, and we could talk about unintended racism or microaggressions, this is none of those. This is the most blatant, clear-cut example of racism. It's that generations of people have recognized this as an overtly racist trope. Within people's lifetimes, black people were still being compared to monkeys and dehumanized but, regularly. So the sacking is right. So I'm not interested in him. I'm not interested in him or what happens to him. By the way, he's already done a show which was more successful than his previous shows since he's been sacked. So. If you're worried about his career, then I suspect... No one's worried about his no career. To, I'm say. not interested what, in him. Talking? I'm worried about the millions of black people who regularly live with this kind of abuse and then have to be in spaces like this where everybody denies it's a problem. That is something that I could not feel more strongly about. And I'm, I'm living it right now in this conversation. It's not, it's not good enough. Originally, I wanted to go into broadcasting and presenting. But when I was about 15, 16 in the United Kingdom, that was not possible. Uh, I would not have been given the opportunity. Oh, because be media was very white. Because it's very white, and people would <laughs> say that I was not, you know, allowed to do that job simply because of the sorry, colour. Like, there's lots of prominent black television presenters um, in the last thirty years. So, okay, name the black female presenters. Lots of them that you're. Well, talking I remember about. when I was a kid. Or there even was, um, better, there was the, um, even... the lady that presented. I can't remember her name exactly, but she presented the children's television program. I think she's been made. Okay, day let's now. make it easier for you. If I was to say to you, name five there was lots of or Blue Peter ten presenters when household, I was little, I'm black. talking about women. No, okay? black female Blue Peter presenters. You're younger okay. than me, but there exactly. was loads exactly. of them. That's, when, a, that's the actually a really interesting point like because and we like can like agree that. Yeah. actually that at that period of time there's probably more representation of women of colour than there is now. Um, I'm a bit confused um, where you stand, Eunice, because on the one hand, I understand that you don't want people to be segmented and compartmentalised and we're all individuals yeah. and we all embrace our individuality. And yet you're saying that there aren't more people that look like me. Why no, no, that's not what I else? said at all. Actually, Actually what I mean, happened is I mean, Jeremy Morris asked me Morris a very Stewart direct question, nothing like which was you, about fashion, and then you lovely women have taken it into a completely different direction. No, I was asked the a question, question and was, I The it. question was, is the fashion industry 
does it have a dangerous impact on, on young we, girls? We will come that to that. Was, that was, yeah, that's what yeah, I was saying. respect. So I want to be honest with you. This is something that you really need to educate yourself on at another time when we have more okay. time. Now, I women of color, women of color, women said. of color. I would say that what you said was extremely patronising as well. What is it going to take for the MPs to sit down and say something's got to be done? Is it going to be your son or your daughter that's going to be killed for you to deal with it? We are fed up of seeing our parents crying. We're fed up of it. We're not supposed to be as adults. We are not supposed to be burying our children. Our children are supposed to be burying us. And I've got 14 grandchildren and I am so scared. So scared. Not only London, this is happening in Manchester, it's happening in Birmingham, it's happening up and down the UK. The only place who has really taken up a stance to say that they are going to do something about it Scotland. is Scotland. Yes. They have got off their backsides and done something, yes. and you lot ain't doing nothing. And this is what I'm working for, to pay my tax, to sit down and watch you lot every year take a £2,000 pay rise yeah. when people are out there suffering. There we go. So we're going to have a discussion on, on this right now. Um, I really want you guys in the 15-minute window we have after the debate to interact with us. So think of some questions that you may have, and we'll get to those questions in just a little bit. Um, can I start off by introducing to the stage football correspondent for the Daily Mirror and also front page columnist, Mr. Darren Lewis. <laughs> can I secondly introduce to the stage award-winning Channel 4 news journalist, Simeon Brown. And last but not least, can I also introduce to the stage author of the book, Think Like a White Man, Mr. Nels Abbey. <laughs> How you doing, sir? You good? Good, good, good. Um, so let me start off by asking all three of you gentlemen, um, I want to get your thoughts on the three clips we've just seen, and then we'll kind of extrapolate it a little bit more. I'll start with you, Darren. Watching those three clips, what, what's the first thing that kind of, kind of comes to mind? What's the first emotion that is, you know, is invoked when you see those clips? My first thought when I see those clips are that they are three clips that kind of sum up the black experience, not just in media, but just in public life, in the workplace. They want you around, but they want you to express an opinion. But when you do, more often than not, they can't cope with that opinion. So they'll try to undermine it. They'll try to talk over it. And the only way that you can reinforce that opinion is by ramming it home, as the woman did in the Question Time clip, so powerfully and so eloquently. And what those clips summed up to me was that we are being, everybody knows it anyway, we're, we're in a situation now where the central debate is about taking the country out of Europe. Nothing else matters. We don't matter. Knife crime doesn't matter. All the issues that are meaningful to us do not matter. So what you have is an elite discussing a future for an elite and everybody else having to fend for themselves. I hear that. Um, Nels, just your initial, your initial kind of thoughts on those, on those three clips. In the, um, in the 2019 classic book, Think Like a White Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a chapter, in chapter six, by Dr. Boulay Whitelaw. I was only told about it, by the way. Um, there's a chapter, in chapter six, it's titled, See No Racism, Hear No Racism, Speak No Racism. And the reason why it says so, it points out, and it's facetious, it's a satirical book. It's facetious, and it's saying that, look, to speak, see, or hear racism is to pretty much put your career at risk. It's to damage yourself. Um, 
I, I think Darren's 100%, I'll, just, I'll make a trip, I'll probably just exemplify that. So Eunice Salumide, the um, Scottish lady, Scottish black lady, Scottish Nigerian lady who you saw over there in clip number two on the Jeremy Vine show, she actually lost a very, very big contract after that simply for that actual clip where she did nothing wrong. She wasn't hostile. She was pretty much dancing on eggshells, moonwalking on eggshells even, um, was very, very polite, didn't really take it, didn't, didn't do what I would do, which is probably call out white supremacy and then leave the table in a, in a blaze of glory or something just like that. <laughs> she was very, very nice about it, but still, it damaged her because the people who had the contract first said that, look, okay, we don't want to be involved in race contro controversy. The point um, as to where we are right now is that it, sorry, I'll, I'll respond to a question. What do I think of those clips? Those clips are exactly what I expected them to be. That's, what, that's how media tends to be. Um, and that's not just a reflection, as Darren pointed out, that's not just a reflection of media or a reflection of the people around the panel. That's a reflection of our society. One thing that you'll never see on, say, the Sky News panel, for example, you won't see Majid Nawaz in a hostile situation because he goes to his table saying exactly what they want to hear. Whereas, um, Majid Nawaz, the Asian guy, sat around the table, whereas Afua will say what she really means, Majid will say what they want to hear, and he's always going to be welcome in situations like that. So, um, I think it's a reflection of what I expect it to be like. Uh, Simeon, what, what are your initial thoughts on those clips? I mean, I mean, I guess a lot of this conversation, as you said at the beginning, is about to what extent do we... What's the word? To what extent do we kind of consent to these platforms and engage in these kind of debates. Now, obviously, I work in television news, and sometimes I'm the person calling people up to say, yo, 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 come on the program today. This is what people are going to be discussing. And I think a lot of it is about the kind of framing of, of those discussions. Now, the pledge is set up to be a very adversarial, hostile space. So any kind of fruitful conversation about anything, let alone race, is just not going to happen, because that's not what the format is for. Question time, I don't really watch it because I don't find it to be an informative show. A lot of the time it's a lot of kind of alternative facts, it's a lot of anger, it's a lot of heat. And I, I don't think it's a platform that, to be honest with you, do you really get much rich debate from, anything interesting. So I, I feel like, for me, I'm not a commentator, but if I was a commentator, I would be far more selective with what things I say yes to if I don't think the debate is going to be fruitful and I don't think the conversation is going to be fair. Someone disagreeing with with, with, with me on something, he doesn't understand it, is one thing. To gaslight you so publicly is, is another. And I don't think that that is healthy, and I think ultimately it leads to a kind of public discourse where the conversation never goes forward because it's just so circular, and it comes to the point where whenever you have kind of debates on important issues, all the meat just gets lost and it's just nonsense. So for me, those clips kind of speak to the kind of debasement of discourse in, in this country and, a, and an inability to... To, to really have nuanced conversations on things that, that matter. Okay, so Darren, let's, let's just get to the nub of the question then. Um, I think some, many of us here know Afua. That clip from Afua on the pledge, probably the most recent and went viral, the most recent example of the frustrations that many people, pundits that go on these programs face. And you can see she was, that clip's even longer, but we, only had, you know, we didn't want to show the whole thing. She, you can see her visibly getting frustrated, annoyed, and actually quite upset, and I spoke to her the following day, and she was really, really upset. Do you, and she was threatening to, to not go back on, because her thing was, what's the point? If we can't, the, the, the debate was, should Danny Baker be sacked for the tweet, which I think personally is a legitimate debate to be had. My personal view was that he should have been sacked, but I, I heard good arguments as to why he shouldn't have been sacked. That's a legitimate debate. But to have that debate, we have to all at least agree the tweet was racist. So in that example, would you back her deciding that, you know what, I can't, even if it means you have no black people on this panel, I can't do this anymore? I think it depends on, as Simeon said, the framing of the debate, the makeup of the panel. We, we are in a position now, I remember when I started at the Daily Mirror 20 years ago, and we, we hardly ever got onto TV to put our case across. But even now, when, we put our, we, when we're invited onto TV so often, the person who's booking isn't black, first of all. The person who's booking is somebody who's well-meaning, but they're not necessarily black. Yeah, the second, so they will just follow an instruction to get a person of colour onto the panel. They're not thinking about what the makeup of the panel should be. Should it be representative? Often they think, if you get one person of colour, you've done your job. So there are lots of different problems with the booking of guests in the first place. The second thing is, 
the framing of the debate. And I, I remember being asked to go on to Radio 5 Live to talk about Raheem Sterling, and I refused because my view was that there is no point criticising the print media for their shortcomings. And they do have shortcomings, and you know, they would accept that. But the broadcast media have shortcomings as well because there is no point criticising the print media and then doing a debate saying, is Raheem Sterling right? Well, what, is he right to say that I don't want to be judged on the basis of the colour of my skin? All agreed that that racism is, you know, well, we know what we think of it. So there is no point them pointing the finger when they're equally at fault for the state that we're in at the moment. Should we not go on to, 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 to platforms? I think that we should have a presence, we should have a voice, but what we shouldn't do is, shouldn't do any more, is fall into these pigeonholes that they want to put us in. Afwa, to many people, is the angry black woman, the woman on the, the, the question time, the angry black woman. What you saw in the faces of the people around Afwa is the way we're viewed when we conform to type. They then look for little things, not to address our opinion or our, our emotion, but to undermine what we're saying so that they can absolve themselves of any blame. Can, so, I, can, can I just say something about that? Just well, something about the notion of an angry black woman or angry black person. Angry black woman, because I really ever hear about... Yeah, I do hear the old term angry black man every now and then. Yes. But sometimes, I often actually try and push it back. I was with um, another writer the other day. We were on a panel and somebody asked her the same question. It was Rene, Rene the Lodge. And they asked the same question about, do you fear coming across as an angry black woman? And I thought, I think it's about time that we actually change that term to slightly as opposed to calling the, as opposed to accepting the term and accepting the phraseology of angry black women to angered black woman or man. Because at that point, you're then putting it back. Because when you see someone, when you actually describe someone as angered, you're then wondering why? Mm. What's, what, what's the root of this? To describe somebody as an angry black person, because I know I'm slightly going off the point, so mm. it really just makes it seem as if that person just roaming around being angry for no reason. But if you push it back, just I think that's the key point with us going on media, and I think it's, that's the one point. It gives us an opportunity at times to really rephrase certain things, to pop the balloon that was sometimes been accepted as, as, um, as, as acceptable debate. The angry black person is a conceived and accepted stereotype. But if we just slightly amend it or so, it then pushes the actual question back to them as to, if you're calling this person angry black woman, why? Mm. Why is she angry? Mm. What has happened to her? What's happening over here? I think that's a valid question to ask. I think it, for that to happen, though, she has to have support on that, that panel. And that's what goes back to what the point I was making about the makeup of the panels. If you have one black person on there against five people, obviously you've got Majid on there, but Majid feels, well, he says what they want. <laughs> but, He's but, not white, but we know what it is. And so what you need... <laughs> It's all black academic. It's all black What you need to have is a, make -up, is, a, is a panel that's representative of an opinion, not one person fighting against four people. So if we accept, Simeon, that a lot of these program makers and the producers, if they, as Darren is saying, and it's true actually, they have a responsibility to get a certain amount of people for a panel, and it's tick, tick, tick. We're not generally in control of those decisions. Afa was never, as an example, she's never going to get a more reflective and representative panel to be on. So what is the point in her being on those panels? I would say that she shouldn't be on the pledge anymore then because they're never going to have a panel that is reflective of different opinions, diverse views, and diverse experiences. What's the point in her being on there if they're always going to have her playing that particular role? I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to tell her not to go on the programme. No, 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 but I mean, but I, mean I, I guess it's hard for me to speak for a, a pundit because I guess the truth is a lot of people who go on these programmes who are professional pundits, I mean, their income is from appearing on these programmes and they're usually there to promote something, i.e. their book or something. So it's a whole ecosystem where people are trying to get an exchange out of it and that might be beneficial. So you might be called on to go on the Ferrari show, get dragged, but you can say, oh yeah, why don't we buy my book? So I mean, as on, the, on an individual level, that is useful for you. But I mean, as a kind of collective, the collective benefit of having a kind of enriched debate which kind of pushes public knowledge forward in a particular area, I mean, if you look at who the host is, you know that they're hostile, you know that they're severely right-wing, you know they're severely biased, you know it's a platform maybe like LBC or something, and you know that actually the conversation is going to be frustrating, it's not going to be helpful, and you're going to go around kind of repeating the same kind of, you know, the same kind of um, really poor ideas that, that, that exist. It's like, on a crypto level, that doesn't benefit the wider community at all. And so actually the irony is that 
it's actually hard for producers to have a conversation like that and call it legitimate without someone black on that panel. Because if it's just white people talking about it, everyone's like, hang on here, this conversation can't really run it. This looks illegitimate from the get-go. So that's where no platforming has an impact. And you know, no, no platform being used as a way to kind of combat fascism by saying, I'm not going to appear on a panel to legitimize fascists. So I thought actually on some panels, removing your consent is the most powerful thing that you, that, that you can do. And I guess that puts pressure back on the producers actually to get it. Why is it that respected black writers and thinkers are saying, we don't want to appear on your program because we don't trust the way that you frame and get these issues. And that puts it back on, on sometimes on, on us, on me, when, when, I'm, when I'm making these programs. And, and especially, Nels, in a time where, okay, the, we might not have programs that are getting the viewing figures of the Piers Morgan Show, you know, LBC, uh, The Pledge, but we do have platforms that are black-owned. Now, I'm not trying to advocate for having black platforms where everybody agrees with each other. We can disagree on, on a particular subject, but at least have an understanding of what the issue is at first. So with the amount of platforms we now have, i.e. this one, do we need to go on these shows, or do you think we always need to have someone on that panel, regardless of, of the platform? I think, it's, I think black platforms absolutely are, are more important than actual than mainstream, or, or by mainstream, my euphemism for white owned in, the, in mm. that, uh, that situation, I'm afraid. But black platforms are more important mm. to us, and ownership of media, and ownership and control of it, and making them bigger and supporting them financially. As you suggested earlier on today, and um, socially, and socially is really important. But I still think it's very important that we don't just end up speaking to ourselves. That it's really important that we do go out on those platforms and actually have discussion. If I could find, if I think back to the, every single step to in our liberation movement, in our movement towards freedom and equality, and now diversity and inclusion, or whatever we're going to describe it as next. If you go back to say the 60s, and you look at say a Malcolm X on TV. Malcolm X was never with another black person there. He was always by himself. But if they did find another black person, it would be a Majid Nawaz style black person or so, who was just pretty much going to agree exactly what they would actually say or so. And um, Martin Luther King had a similar situation too, although Martin Luther King was treated with a lot more reverence than Malcolm X was. If you go to, even if you look at shows like Donahue, which wasn't broadcast in Britain, it was broadcast in America, it was this kind of like somewhere, like Jerry Springer, but when Jerry Springer was still a bit more respectable. So when they used to have like, almost like Al Sharpton type people on there, mm -hmm. Al Sharpton was one of them. So you think Al Sharpton or Farrakhan or all these other people, so they'll go on these shows, even though I might not have agreed with everything they were saying, but they saw a purpose to those shows, which was to actually exploit them to get their message out there at the same time. So it wasn't just, hey, to go on the show to just have a debate with an idiot on the other side. They knew they were debating who was, on, who was, pra who was practically, they knew they were debating a functioning idiot or a person pretending to be an idiot, but they knew that at the same time too, they were getting their message across. But there was another subtle element to it too, uh, particularly in relation to people like, I don't know, many, many people, when you see somebody from our background go into the lion's den and lay it down and walk out there and win, it does have an effect on the people like us watching at home. It does make it clear, it does, it does have an esteem-boosting impact that, yeah, that's how I lay things down, that's how I do it. I remain cool, I remain calm, I remain, um, I remain on point, I remain on fact, and I take it forward from there and I win the conversation. So it's, it serves a purpose, it serves many different purposes. And of course, if you are, as Simeon pointed out, if you are a pundit or you have got something to promote at the same time too, getting out to a wider audience, for example, is very, very important. And um, what role, uh, Darren, does the audience members play in terms of holding panelists to account and calling out when they see a lack of diverse opinions, perspectives. What, what role can, in the, in the final clip there, the question time one, we saw a woman who was very impassioned, very, very upset um, about the lack of, I suppose, care that politicians are giving to people from, from our community. Is there a role that audience members can play in holding panelists to account? Well, this, this, she performed it superbly. Um, and whenever they, often with shows like Question Time, they go into areas and they try to patronise the people around them. Um, so when there is an opportunity to tell it like it is, it's important to take that opportunity. Um, you talk about going viral, that clip went viral as well. Well, lots of people down here and in Scotland, you know, giving the, her their support. Because people on that panel, one of whom was Kwasi Kwate, who... Well, I was going to say, so is it not just about having a black person on the panel? Because they would say, well, we had a black person on the panel. Is it about a particular kind of black person we need on these panels? <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Well, Nell said, said it best. You know, some, often they'll get somebody who thinks 
the way or says what they want to say. And if it, it's not somebody who says what they want to say, if somebody who could be difficult, they'll think twice sometimes because they won't necessarily want to hear what that person has got to say. Which is an act, by the way. Which is one, I don't believe that Kwasi Kwarteng doesn't believe that Boris Johnson's racist or Magic Nawaz that um, hangs around all these extreme right-wingers not knowing. I, I, know it's, I know it's worse, but it's an, it's an act, it's a hustle. It's the game, it's the game that, that they play. It's how they get to where they're going to. I was just, sorry, I was, I was doing, I'm writing a book and I was researching Kwasi Kwarteng the other day. And in 2009, when he was actually running to become MP during the selection committee, he said that my parents came to this country in 1962 from the Gold Coast. Now, anybody who's a student of history automatically knows what he was doing there. He referred to Ghana by its colonial name, which had lost its colonial name by five years by the point he got to Britain. But he knew in front of that all-white audience, he knew it would play well. It would sound well by referring to Ghana by its colonial name, by its, uh, by its colonial name. And um, he did that. And there's a certain message that people send out. But it's an act. It's things that people do to get to where they're getting, to, to get to where they're going to. It's painful because those people are still representative of us. They take up space. They don't really help move our, our course forward. They almost um, capitalize on racism for their own purpose and a personal basis, but it's an act. It's, it's, it eventually, it all comes crashing down. Uh, just finally, Simeon, um, you kind of alluded to it earlier on, but if we do agree that we have to, or if, as Nels and Darren are saying, it's important that we do have someone on these panels, is it therefore then about being more strategic? And if we're gonna go on these, these these, these shows where we know the presenter's agenda, we know the agenda of the show, we have to be very clear about what we want from it. I, as you mentioned, I know that I can't change the audience's mind, but I'm here to promote my book, and I don't really care if I don't change anybody's mind on, on this particular t topic or subject. I mean, when you say we need to be more <laughs> strategic, it's not like we as black people collectively no, we are sitting there saying, okay, we're well, putting this man out today, we're putting out, I mean, that's not how it runs. I mean, my, my, my thing is more like looking at the structure of this industry and looking at the kind of the mechanism by which decisions are made, how we're gonna frame it, who we're gonna pick, what are gonna be the issues and the outcome of that whole process in what oftentimes is a mess is a messy, kind of gaslit, kind of completely kind of sausage de debate. And for me, it's like I'm not saying that you know black people shouldn't engage with mainstream media. You know, I work in mainstream media and I think that you know, we need to be present and we need to be in editorial meetings and we need to be kind of feeding in. And I and I think that Channel 4 News does it better than most other mainstream outlets, to be honest with you, and I, and I, and I think that there's a reason for that because some of the people who are behind the scenes. But I'm talking, but looking at the entire industry, it's like for 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 me, it's like the pressure comes from the contributors saying, you know what, your problem, your show, isn't leading to a constructive debate because it's where does that pressure to reform come from? That 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 is the key question because otherwise you're gonna you're gonna keep getting shows like the Pledge, and you know you you would say yeah she she gave it to them. But the truth is, is that most people at home just see what they wanted to see and take what they wanted to take and they believe whatever they believe to begin with. So we look at it and we're like, yeah, boom, you said the thing, bang. My man, my man who maybe lives in Middle England voting Brexit, he's like, what's she talking about? I don't know. You know, I mean, that, that, that conversation wasn't actually fruitful for anybody. You just like believe what you wanted to believe and then it becomes clickbait viral content, which is so like meaningless and ephemeral. There'll be another one tomorrow, day after, day after, and then in the end, if you've actually got nowhere and we're having the same conversation in 10 years just because it's created this, this same system of, of, of nonsense. Can I just go on the back of that? I mean, that almost goes back to what we were saying about the angry black woman thing. Yeah, yeah we, we can... Anger. Yep. Well, I was going to say, yep. we can redefine what that term is. Yeah. But to people in Middle England, that's what they see. Yeah. That's that, and that's I mean, cause, what I we mean, have ultimately, to guard we're, we're talking about public space. And public space, right, is where very... Different people, the people with the left, leftist politics, people with right politics, people with centrist politics, where everybody engages and is like a marketplace of ideas. And you want to kind of further this conversation of, of, of what conversation everybody collectively is having. The thing is right now is that we're not really moving forward as, as, collect, as collectives in this collective conversation because it's just like everyone's coming in, just saying whatever, saying their piece and believing whatever they would believe in the first place. There's no kind of informative process happening. And, and, I, and that for me is is how you get you know, your Trumps and your Brexit and all these kind of issues. So for, for me, it's about how can we get an informed conversation on race so that when the Windrush scandal happens, everyone's like, oh my God, how did that happen? Yes. How do we get here? Mm -hmm. I'm shocked. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is the process. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is how British is racialized. And then suddenly, like, you know, British history is so misunderstood. It's like, black history is not black history. It's just the other side of history that you don't tell. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, 
how can we get a public space where this happens? And actually, black pundits have been complicit in this, in this space declining because, you know, you're coming on to shows for £150 fee and ultimately not pushing that conversation forward and not pushing that process forward and not holding the entire structure to account. I hear that. Um, right, let's get some questions from you guys out there. And they can be just points as well. I don't mind if they're not necessarily questions. The gentleman at the front. Oh, it's Marvin. Um, the guy at the front. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, really good chat. Jordan, kudos for the video, because I've seen the clip. I think when you put it all together, it just highlights just the consistency, regardless of what the actual show is. We try. Um, and I think, Jordan, something you said at the beginning really resonated with me, because I was always looking at it from my perspective. Obviously, I've got two young children, both at the age of three. And I think what's interesting for me is, right now, they're all about innocence, right? They don't really know anything about racism. I've never talked to them about the colour of the skin in that sort of context. But one of the things that came to mind as you guys talked about it is, and I think Darren mentioned it in regards to the people who are booking and, and people in the media, and it got me thinking about my upbringing and what success looks like mm -hmm. and what my wife's success looks like. like no, no, I don't think either of our sets of parents were saying, I want you to get into journalism. I want you to write books. I think it was like lawyer, doctor. That, that sort of profession is, is what we're pushed towards. And I guess one, my question to the panel is, because I think when you said about should they do it, I was like, of course we should, we should be represented. But is there, a, is, there a, is there something a bit more about what's happening at home and what success looks like about encouraging and inspiring our young children to get into media. And not necessarily, I think, I think our moms were just saying, we want you to go to a job that makes the most money, not about what can make the most impact to our culture. So is, is there something more about what can be done at home and what success looks like? Not, not really, no. I, I think that quite a lot of black people are, are, are pretty much busting, fighting to get into media. That if you ever go to, if you want to see an angered audience, Go to a diversity in media um, a, a audience, so I guarantee you, it's like the Royal Rumble in there. Everybody's fighting the people on the panel because there's extreme barriers to entry, and it's part of that control not wanting to actually let people get in, uh, get, get in there, which might not seem, I don't think it's conspiratorial, I think it's become quite cultural at the same time, too. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Jones, by the way. Hi, Jones. Um, I also work in the media, and um, we can touch on about producers. So if you're putting the show across, because you, you want the attention. So producers are aware of what each panel is thinking before they're going to say. So for instance, someone like Ifwa, she's, um, she's black, she's seen as a feminist, she's also seen as a lefty, so they know exactly what they're going to get from her. When it comes to this whole racial issue, my point is, if we look at the Jews, if you make any form of allegation against a Jewish person, you are legal. So until us black people we are able to get to a position or come together and get to the stage where it doesn't matter if somebody makes any racial um, uh, statement or anything that has any racial connotation to it, we just call it as it is. There's no argument. You can't deny it. Mm. Something like Ben Baker, what he did. There's so many adjectives that you can use to describe someone other than not. There's no debate whether it was racist or not racist. It is racist. And until we get to that point, we're going to keep having this conversation. Because if you happen to be a Jewish person, I can assure you, no debate will go with that. It suddenly it. got very hot in here, all of a sudden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Jones. Any other questions or gentlemen next to him got a question? Yeah, thank you. I'd yeah, just like to say that, um, yeah, so. This is a question to the panel, especially to the author of um, Think Like a White Man. Um, what is it with the English people, the English black people, uh, in terms of entrepreneurialism, uh, putting together businesses, um, thinking big, compared to the black people in America? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone's seen, I mean, even Mike Tyson's got his own chat show now on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no barriers to entry anymore for people to, to put something together on YouTube um, and, and have their own platform and, and, and spread the knowledge and spread black. Uh, so what is it you're asking, sir? Yeah, so what, what is it? What's going on with English people? 
compared to the American people. English black people. English black people, okay. yeah. Why we seem so um, shut down, closed, um, you know, not in terms of um, compared to black Americans who seem to have no fear. Go on, mm. I think. Um, I challenge the notion of English black people. I'm sure that, 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 that it's very rare if they do exist at all. Um, but <laughs> with my, my perspective or so. But then, um, but also too, I don't think, I don't think, I think the Americans, we often romanticize them, but they have similar problems to us, but often at a, um, at a different scale. Because again, when you see how many, there's about, well, there's multiple times the number of, of them, I think about 10 times the number of um, African Americans than there are to black Britons. Um, so, yeah, in terms of opening business or so, yeah, it's become a little bit more, uh, uh, um, African Americans, particularly African American women are becoming a lot more aggressive at opening up their own business, doing their own things or so and so on and so forth. It's actually part of the recommendation of being like a white man. But in terms of um, us, um, I, I'm seeing it more and more and more. Even what Jordan is doing, for example, I know loads of young people who work in media, work in banking, work in all sorts of um, organizations, Everybody has one eye outside and establishing their own thing and are quietly doing so. So I don't really know anybody with one hustle nowadays. Everybody, see, most people have two hustles, doing two, maybe three hats. Hi, I was really interested in um, what you said about the strategy when you're, you're going onto somebody's platform. I wanted to know, do you have a kind of network that you sort of work with people who are going on to different shows? No. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Simeon, Darren? Yes, we do. No, you're, you're all in it. Go on. You go. You go. I'm running over there, so there's somebody else. Somebody no, we are, we, are, we are all part of, of, of a network where we talk about shows that we might go on. We talk about the content of shows, uh, the makeup of panels, uh, the reaction uh, that any given show may well have. Um, as with any big group, there are subgroups as well um, where we also talk about opportunities that might come up to get into the media. I mean, when we talk about there should be a movement, let's be clear, there already is a movement. You know, There already is a, a, a body of media people who are working together to make sure that we not only push our message forward, but also that we can create opportunities for other people to get into it. Because all of us know about uh, the struggles that we had decades ago to get into this thing. And, and now, there are more of us, many more than us, than there were, say, 10, 20 years ago. So now what we have to keep doing is maintaining that momentum and making sure people get in, not just pushing our message out, obviously that's obviously important, but making sure that other younger people have got a pathway to get through as well. Uh, can we get a huge round of applause for our panellists, Nels, Simeon and Dan? Thank you very much, guys.